Uh, just to give you a very brief uh, background on what I do. So I was trained as a social psychologist, which means that I was trained to be a researcher. I've always been interested in health-related topics. And for a number of years now, I've been working with people who have undergone transplant. Um, so I developed, for instance, the writing program um, that Maria mentioned. Um, and one of the things that I've been very interested in as we use writing is how it helps people sort of sort through their experience and come to an understanding and appreciation. And then one of the things that we've been interested in doing is trying to figure out how that can help them further maybe share their experience with others and how they can benefit from that, but also other people can benefit then from understanding what it's like to go through transplant. Um, so that's it for me. And good morning, I'm Heather Harpham, um, <clears throat> and I'm one of the people who benefit from the process that Dr. Rini's describing and, and has developed. I, obviously, we didn't have a chance to work together um, directly before now, but um, when uh, my daughter is 16, and when she was uh, between three and a half and four and a half, she underwent a transplant and had been sick from birth until then. So... Um, during that time, when she was actually sick and recovering, I wrote a great deal in a Caring Bridge page and did a lot of writing for myself and later transformed that writing um, with a lot of blood, sweat, and no shortage of tears um, into um, this memoir, Happiness, which, which will be out in August. Um, and I was a writer before the transplant experience, so it was it was a it was a go to tool for me. It was something that I knew would be a form of support and help and a, a way to help organize that flood of feelings and reactions that we're all having daily when we're in the medical realm. Um, I don't think I really need to say anything beyond that. Um, I will say that that second to the bottom um, bullet point can take place at any point in the process. I just want to really emphasize because for some of us, writing at the end of a harrowing day is really meaningful and that's the perfect time to write. And for others of us, you need three years between you and the harrowing day before you can even begin to sit down and try and describe your experience. And, and anywhere in between, beyond. Um, so I really think that whether or not you think of yourself as a writer, or whether or not it's a, a comfortable um, mode of expression for you, it can sometimes be really helpful at any point along the process. Yeah. And um, I think that's enough. Oh, yeah. OK. So. So we're talking this morning about a very particular kind of writing, and that is expressive writing, which has an aim of offering some therapeutic benefit to the writer. <laughs> it's not necessarily about other people in the way that writing typically is, right? Writing is usually a communicative tool. I want to communicate with someone beyond the self, a reader, an audience. Um, but expressive writing is writing in which you're trying to communicate with yourself in some way and to organize and formalize and externalize your own experience. Um, and there's research to support the benefits of that, even done in a very um, uh, simple way, even at just spending, you know, 15, 20 minutes a day writing for just a few days. It's been shown to, to be a really um, therapeutic process for some. And, and Dr. Rini could back that up with research that I don't have at my fingertips, but she does. Um, so it's personal writing focused on expressing your deepest thoughts and feelings about a trauma or severely stressful event. I think for almost all of us, whatever medical journey we've been through qualifies as a severely stressful event to say the least. It's a, a form of expressive therapy that helps you explore and transform difficult emotional experiences through an art form. And, um, you know, we're talking about writing this morning. Of course, you could go out and paint. You could dance. You could, you know, whatever it is that gets um, you in touch with 
the kind of deepest layer of experience that many of us can't access when we're actually in the moment, um, by all means, do it. We're just here to share the writing part. Um, and again, this is about the writing we're talking about is um, process, not product. So although I'm here to talk about the book and what, ca what can happen um, or to point to possibilities beyond, that's not the overt objective of expressive writing, which is really inviting you to engage in a process without any worry about product, what you're producing. And, and as the last slide says, there are so many ways to do this, and we're going to practice one particular kind developed by um, James Pennebaker mm -hmm. um, in the 80s. And Chris is, Dr. Rini is very familiar with that process and will set us up to do it. Okay? The last thing I wanted to do before we okay, set that up um, is I just wanted to share with you kind of thinking about that process product um, duality. I wanted to share with you an example of some of the writing I did very early on, some expressive writing, really, that comes from the moment my daughter was going through her transplant, which she had parenthetically at Duke. Though we live in New York, we came down here because Duke um, Pediatric uh, Cord Blood Transplant Unit was the one with the, the most experience. Um, and so we came here. We, and we lived in um, Durham for 10 months. So, um, so I'll, I'll share a little piece of this. And then I'll share with you something from the book, sort of where it went from process-oriented to, to something final that is on the page that's hoping to communicate with a wider audience. Um, so this is writing that I did um, in the wake of Gracie actually getting her transplant. As any of you, as all of you, I guess, will know, there's so much that goes up to the moment of transplant. It's like this incredible push. And transplant itself can sometimes feel kind of anticlimactic. It's, you know, because it's not an operation in, unless you're receiving an organ, which is a different realm. Um, around noon, they came in with a bag of Gabe's blood. Gabe is my son, who was our daughter's donor. It looked just like it did in California, a big, glorified Ziploc bag of red cells. There's nothing remarkable about it, and there was nothing remarkable about the transplant itself, which was bizarre. Everyone was so worried, sending emails, calling, calling, emailing again for an update. They imagined something major happening. The words bone marrow transplant invoke a violent rearranging of delicate interior spaces. But it was simple, so simple. They hung up the bag of cord blood, attached it to her central line, and opened the clamp to let Gabe's cells flow into Gracie's peripheral bloodstream. And this is... Gabriel's gift, a glorified Ziploc stuffed with stem cells from the day of his birth. Now Gabriel is two. He has options and verbs and aversions. He has an incredibly complicated cocktail of feelings about his sick sister, love and anxiety and jealousy, admiration. But the bag is more or less invisible to him. He looks up at it in Bobby's hands. Bobby was our nurse without seeing it. It is another piece of hospital paraphernalia, another thing of mystery. That's, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's just um, to kind of point to the possibility of taking something, if you so desired, down the line from that original state where you're capturing primary process and then later wanting to to craft it into a communicative tool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, expressive writing, the way that James Pennebaker designed it. So James Pennebaker is a social psychologist, and he started working on this in the 80s. And he 
realized that, um, you know, in like talk therapy and in other forms of therapy, that one of the things that people accomplish is to take disorganized thoughts and feelings and translate them into language. And that that helps them sort of, if they were stuck because all those things were sort of twirling around, um, it helps them sort of think through what it meant to them and what, how they felt about it so that they could put it behind them and move on and also communicate it better to others as well, which is so helpful for a lot of people. So he sort of started to experiment with talking and writing and found um, that it actually worked so incredibly well, this very brief form of writing. And he's used it with lots and lots of people who've had lots and lots of different things go on in their lives. And he's found it helps them reduce their physical symptoms and their distress, physical health benefits. And, and everybody is sort of amazed at what this brief writing can do even when people don't particularly like to write or think they can do it well. And, and one of the things that I've found that's been really interesting to me is that people will come into a study, for instance, where I say, I'm going to make you write, and they say, well, I don't really like to write, and I don't do it well, and I don't think I can have much to say, but if you want me to, I'll do it. And then they do it, and they say, wow, that was amazing. I had more to say than I thought, and it really was very powerful. So I think it takes people by surprise if they hadn't tried it before to give it a try. So basically there are, like, there are literally hundreds of studies conducted that show that there are improvements. Now, that's, I, I think that's nice, that's great, but I think the experience of it, the process of it is really important. Whether you could show that some physical symptom changed on a measure in a study is one thing, but how it affects you in your everyday life I think is much, much more important. But on your handout, there are some readings that if you're interested in learning more about that, you can look them up. So there are lots of different versions of the writing instructions. We're going to give you one form today. Um, there's another form on your handout. And, uh, but basically, the, the uh, process goes like this. You commit to yourself that you're going to write for at least 15 minutes a day over three to four days. And that's literally it. Turn on the timer. Time yourself. Or you can do it once a week over three to four weeks. Uh, you try to find a time when you won't be disturbed in a place where you feel comfortable. Um, you can write longhand. You can type. If you have a hard time doing either of those, you could even speak into a recording device. The important thing here is to translate things into language and kind of get that out. Um, and I will give you specific instructions, and you have some other instructions in your handout too, but basically you're going to write continuously about any aspect of your experience you want. And the instructions kind of help you think about some things you might write about because some people get stuck there. I don't know what I would want to write about. So they give you some, uh, some examples. But, and it's very important to write continuously. So if you run out of things to say, you just repeat something you've already said. Um, you can write about the same thing on all three to four writing days and kind of keep delving into one particular part of your experience. You can write about something different each day. It's completely up to you. So there's a lot of latitude. Um, the important thing from James Pennebaker's perspective is that you're just writing for yourself. This is not, at this point, for anybody else's eyes. If you want to later take it, like, like Heather did, and turn it into something that you share with others, you do that after the fact. Right now, the main thing is just to get it down on paper. And James Pennebaker would say, tear it up afterwards, burn it flush it, you know, whatever. This is not ever to be seen. Now, some people hold on to it and reread it, re -read it later and kind of revisit their experience as well. You don't worry about spelling, punctuation, or grammar. Those things are really unimportant. You just get your thoughts and feelings on paper. And um, but as I said, you destroy it or you put it in a safe place. So you can, you know, when you think about all the different things that happened and what you might want to delve into, you might want to think about something that you're thinking or worrying about too much that might be a sign that it needs to be sort of organized and translated into language, something that you feel is affecting your life in an unhealthy way, um, something you've been avoiding or something you've been finding hard to discuss with others. Um, now, today, we're going to have you write. In just a few moments, I'm going to read you some instructions so that you can get the experience of this. It is an emotional process. Um, so what can you expect? 
you might feel sad or down during the writing or for a short time afterwards. It's like if you see a sad movie, you know how sometimes it kind of changes your mood for a short time. That feeling shouldn't last for long. If it does, then you would, that's probably a sign that you need to talk to someone and you may have a friend or a family member or a therapist or a clergy person or, you know, just reaching out to other people here. Um, but typically it doesn't last for long. And most people find that it's because they're releasing emotions and revisiting things, but it's not a bad experience. Um, but so today, as you write, if you feel like this is not the time and place where you want to delve into something really meaningful, but you want to, you know, write because everybody else is, or something like write your laundry list, or, you know, write your grocery list, and then try this at home. However you want to handle it is fine. Okay, so let me go ahead and read some instructions for you. And um, you've got a pen and you've got paper. And then we're going to have you write for seven minutes. So about half the time that you would do this at home. And just to emphasize that you're really free to go in any direction with your writing over those seven minutes. Don't feel that if you started with one topic, you've got to keep mining that. You, yeah. Wherever the writing takes you is, is where you're meant to go. Yeah. So um, absolutely give yourself freedom. So these are instructions borrowed from a friend of mine who works at UCLA, Annette Stanton, who's, you know, just, who's been exploring the various kinds of writings people can do. And, and in this particular case, she really wanted to focus on positive parts of the experience, which is different than what James Pennebaker did. And his, his uh, instructions are in the handout. So this is what Annette does. Um, what we'd like you to do today is to write about any positive thoughts and feelings about your experience with transplant. Um, or you can write about another stressful experience. You don't have to focus on transplant. It's up to you. Um, so if, if you choose to do that, when I mention transplant, just think about your other experience. So we realize that people experience a full range of emotions about transplant, but we'd like you to focus on some positive emotion thoughts and life changes that you have co that have come out of your experience. So for example, some people feel that they've gained important lessons out of their experience with transplant. Um, in this writing exercise, we want you to try about, to write about positive thoughts, experiences, and feelings. Um, things that you've encountered over the course of your transplant from the time you or your loved one was diagnosed until now. And you might also tie your positive thoughts and feelings about your experiences to other parts of your life. So your childhood, for instance, people you love, who you are, or who you want to be. Um, and in your writing, just use first names, um, but um, actually, you don't need to do that because this is for you. Ideally, we'd like you to write without stopping for seven minutes. If you run out of things to say, again, just repeat what you've written until the seven minutes are up, and don't worry about spelling, grammar, or sentence structure. Don't worry about erasing things or crossing things out. Just write freely. Okay? So go ahead and start writing. Pleasure to look out and watch you all, right? Yeah. So, now we're, we're going to just have a discussion, and if you don't want to share, don't. That's completely fine. But we just wanted to ask first so, as you were writing, what did you notice that you liked? Things that, was there any kind of sensation or experience that you thought was good? And, and if you're going to share something, we'll hand you the mic so that your voice can oh, yeah. be recorded for the podcast as well. You can hear your talk. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I do just want to um, maybe briefly say your name. And oh, surely. Yeah, surely. Suzanne Nelson. Um, I immediately thought about the transplant that I had, mm -hmm. and so that I went back and, um, and I wrote about what how fortunate I felt because I had been through cancer before like 12 years earlier mm -hmm. and what was available was only um, chemotherapy mm -hmm. and that there were other options mm -hmm. for me now so I felt um, I never felt depressed I never felt poor me it's like wow there's something out here that might be able to keep me alive for a while so mm -hmm. it was a very positive experience and just sitting there with one nurse watching those cells being mm -hmm. um, accumulating in a big plastic bag yeah. and knowing that they're uh, they would she said we will ne we won't need all these and I said what do you do with them 
And she said, well, that they're there um, when or if you need them. And mm-hmm. then, of course, that they can use them for, you know, other, other patients. Mm-hmm. So knowing that I contributed something not only to myself but, but potentially to other patients was, um, it, it was a, a rewarding experience. Okay. And as you were writing about that, what did, is there anything that came that was sort of enlightening about it? Or what did, what did the writing do, if anything? If nothing, that's fine. Um, I think it... For me, um, I keep telling myself I need to write, I need to write, um, and I do keep a travel journal. Uh-huh. And I have written lots of things here and there, but I've been telling myself that, Suzanne, you're a good writer. You should be writing, and even if you do it for your own, pur- you know, your own self-purpose, um, I think... Um, I think this is going to be an impetus for me to just to go forth and say, Suzanne, why are you not writing about this? I did keep a journal when I was in the transplant unit, okay. but granted, it was just you know not big long sessions. But um, yeah. I, you know, from what I understand from where I was at UNC and from other people, I I walked the equivalent of four uh, marathons in the hospital um, in, in the wing mm-hmm. um, so that and I was working in my fifth one but I just didn't but I ran out of time so I just think um, you know what and I remember talking to my grandchildren when I visited with them um, when they came to visit me I mean I visited them uh, when they came to breakfast I had one medal by each one of their breakfast plates and of course they didn't know anything about what how I earned them and I explained how I earned them and I said, I want you to know that uh, any time that you feel as if you can't do something, I want you to look at the medal and to know that your grandmother, I'm called Gigi, that Gigi walked um, all these miles in, in the hospital when she was going through stem um, mm-hmm. cell nice. transplant. And uh, if I can do this at my age, then you can do anything. <laughs> so that was, my, that was my gift. I think my walking was a gift to me, of course. But giving those um, medals, like like I said, they were like um, Olympic medals, mm-hmm. giving them, you know, with a red, white, and blue ribbon, and giving them each one of them, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it may make a difference sometime in their future. Mm-hmm. And that's, um, you know, it was kind of like a serendipity for me. Mm-hmm. Like, what am I going to do with these? And I thought, hmm. But so, it's, well, it's interesting that yeah. both, the, both the reflections that you've shared have to do with the meaning of giving. You know, that your cells might matter to some another patient down the line and that your medals are there for your grandkids. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought about yeah. that, that theme, but yeah. you're right. Yeah. 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 Anybody else who, who would thank you? Yeah. Who would like to share? Wonderful. And if you'll let us know your name. Uh, Rich Ferguson. I have never written thought about it, but now as I was here. She had ovarian cancer. And she did so much to me. And, and we sort of helped each other. And I had really never even thought about it till now. And it just came to me. And you know, you know, I have no problem crying or nothing. But, you know, she was worried about me. And I was worried about her. And she, she you know, she was at stage four. And she knew she was going to die. And and so, but, but her concept. You know, she was thinking about me. I was thinking about her. You know, like we were going cruises. You know, we went to a lot of concerts and everything. I tried to uh, help her, and I think I need to write about it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And you I began, Sarah. You began. Yeah. Thank you. You can leave. Anybody? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I'm Gail Peterson. Um, my husband has multiple myeloma, and it's been close to the years. I've used the writing process all along. I am a writer, mm-hmm. not published, but out of hobby, out of need. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a great mental organizer. Um, and I have used yeah. this entire process over the last three years to um, process my own journey and what, what his journey was doing for me. And um, it also hit me in a really rough time because I've been caretaking my parents for about um, four years prior to that and then had to put it into my sister's hands. Um, So I was already a mess in in this spiritual journey of mine. And so I have been writing a lot and um, 
I'm super excited about being here and, and, and learning to look at it from a different point of view because I think I didn't understand. I needed the terminology, as you talked about, process, product, expressive, that kind of, that, that was really helpful for me. Okay. But I had no clue what I was going to sit in and write about. I just um, began to, to think, all right, the other day I asked myself a question. Have I ever really understood what it was like to be my husband? A beautiful question. Mm-hmm. Uh, because mm-hmm. because I've, I've been his micromanager, his caretaker, his lover, his everything for three years. But after it, I'm and I'm having time to reflect back. Um, who was I winning for on day mm-hmm. one? Was I was I a really capable of understanding what his battle was? Because I I clearly understood mine. But three years later, I don't know that I really clearly understood mm-hmm. his because I believe more than just his blood was transplanted, our whole lives have, have been flushed and changed and flushed and changed for mm-hmm. three years to the point where I believe that I can now see clearer to who he is. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the answer to that question, but, but today in just starting there, I realize that's a question I need to ask and to to find my vision on that and understand oh. that because that again is another part of of what his journey mm-hmm. and my participating in that journey is mm-hmm. doing to make my life a better life at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's that's how I use the writing to uh, because I believe that there is no no journey, no crisis, no tragedy, no struggle, no illness that is ever meant to leave us dead at the end. It is meant to bring some kind of fire of transformation, something beautiful, some gift, some deep. Human beings, we were meant to find beauty in suffering. And I intend to do that through this. You know, That's my plan. And um, I just I really love how writing can sometimes uncover mm. those places and those questions, those thoughts that, um, as you were saying, sometimes until you start putting pen to paper mm-hmm. and letting your mind have that freedom, sometimes you won't realize the thoughts that the heart is thinking. Oh, that's, that's so wonderful. Thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah. And yeah. I think you pointed to the last thing you said, you said so many beautiful things, but the last thing that you said is such a beautiful reminder that Often we don't even know what we're really feeling until we take the time to listen to ourselves. And one way of listening is writing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. My name is Donna, and um, this is very helpful coming to this because I had my transplant three years ago. Mm -hmm. And... I never really wrote about it because I was just too scared to write about it. I was trying to stay alive. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought, well, three years out, it's kind of too late to write about it. You know, it's been three years. <laughs> and so this is really quite helpful for me to know that I can go back and don't process it because I know yeah. I was just so busy getting through it for me and my, my family and everything that they went through for me. And, I just, I was just uh, I kept writing, I'm so lucky for this, I'm so lucky for that. And, um, but I'm still feeling just so upset and so sad and angry. And But I've moved on in my life, so it's, it's just very strange. I feel like a, 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 with one of those Russian dolls that keep holding stuff up. I like I can still just in the privacy of my time mm-hmm. just sit and like process because I know I haven't really processed any of it yet. I just wanted to get through it and get it behind me, but it's just still I'm still stuck in it. Yeah. Um, but it's to know I could, I could do it now. <laughs> That's right. And it actually, uh, three years after, it's great. I mean, it's fine. A lot of people start then. It's yeah. like yeah. It's so Never too late. Very yes. Oh, thanks. When I started to work on the book, I had you know a lot of writing from the transplant, and I really couldn't look at it for five years. It really. Huh. I kept saying, "Are you going to make it into a book?" And I, 
I don't know, it, it just takes time. Sometimes you have to get that perspective, breathing room, so that you can look back. And, yeah. Great. I just ask a question. Um, I wear hearing, I, I, no, I had nothing to do it. I wear hearing aids. Mm -hmm. um, I just, um, I, I can hear you and I can, you know, but it, it doesn't seem like the microphones are. Is there anything, was there any problems that you noticed as you were writing? Like anything that came to mind that you, a question or something you didn't like about it? What do you mean about didn't like it? Well, is there anything that bothered you or even just a question that was raised in your mind about am I doing this right or is that, you know, the best thing or something that's sort of going to nag at you if you don't bring it up right now? Sir? No, I, I, I felt that I couldn't decide in writing this fast and I can read my writing. Um, it, it is what when I get home, I, I think I'm going to be using um, my laptop mm -hmm. because I can actually, you know, type faster than I than I can write mm -hmm. and uh, be able to go in and uh, and be sure to, in case any of you don't do this, is to back up what you have. Yeah. And so you have uh, more than one site or one location for what you've done so you don't lose that because you'll never get it exactly right same way the second time around. Yeah. Okay. Anything else pressing? Because we have one last thing we want to do with you that will take. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter whether you handwrite or type. It's still yeah. Thing. It doesn't matter. And from the research. Yeah. It and you can even speak it into, for instance, a recording advice, a device if you want to go back and read this today. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is it for most of us? Yes, writing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, go ahead. So we'd like you to, um, to actually interact with the writing in a, a small way right now in thinking that this is uh, just a, a kind of very um, foundational step if you did want to take this writing and turn it towards a more communicative piece of writing. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we'd like you to do is I'm going to give you about two minutes to read over what you've written and to identify one sentence that feels powerful, potent, that's got energy in it, that catch it, captures your attention. So look over what you've written and please, you know, underline, asterisk, in any way you need to mark for your eye um, one powerful sentence. If it looks like it and reads like oatmeal, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. No, I know, but I said, and then we think of something that we want to add to it. Can we add a sentence? Oh, sure. Yeah. If you want to become your own editor in these two go for it. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, and by the way, yeah, if you don't want to share something, that's fine too. Yeah. Just if you happen to have yeah. something there that you would like this to is, read. This is still at the level where you're talking to yourself. Yes. Right? You see for yourself a sentence that looks mm -hmm. potent. And if there is anything you want to do to that sentence to clarify an image or reorder words, this is your last moment. Um, so, you're, you know, we set this up under the umbrella of expressive writing in a conversation with yourself, so you're under absolutely no obligation to share. Please don't feel the need to if you don't wish to. If you would like to share, we would love to hear. Um, so. Is there anyone who wants to offer their sentence? <laughs> Wonderful. Three years later, I might say more things have been transplanted than Justine's blood cells because everything has changed. Normal is a shattered illusion. Would you oh, mind reading it one more time? Oh, gosh. She's going to give it to us again. <laughs> Three years later, I might say more things have been transplanted than just my Dean's blood cells. Everything has changed. Normal is a shattered illusion. I'll share just part of the sentence. Um, oh, great. It was about watching um, the stem cells being collected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I said it was a different process, of course, but it was interesting to view the accumulated cells in the thick plastic bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So that yeah, there are two beautiful examples of different perspective. Yeah. Right. And that shifting perspective can be so important in writing. Here we're at the granular 
microscopic level, watching cells accumulate in a bag. And here we're back, we're up high, looking at how what used to feel normal has been, you, know, you put it so beautifully, it's a shattered yeah. illusion. Um, something you believed in that yeah. I think for me it kind of helps me understand, you know, just the, the, the various different ways you can look at this and the things that capture your attention and why, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. um, and, and what they mean for people. Yeah. Last call. Wonderful. I, I can share something. Yes, yeah, please. I'm a writer yeah. that works oh, you for wrote. patients. Mark, you I wrote. did. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not God, can't heal all of the the patients I talk to, but at least I can love them from my heart, quietly, secretly, and at night praying for them for strength, endurance, and to find the wonderful things that a human being can share love. Oh, I love that. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's how the healthcare people feel about patients. <sighs> I, I don't think you stay long in that position if you can't. If, if your heart's not there. Mm. True. Mm. Wow. I don't think we could have ended things. Yes, more beautiful. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Mara. So, um, just to kind of close up, there's no right or wrong way to do this. It really is. It's something that is a tool for you. And again, it's the process of putting the pen to paper or speaking or typing and sorting through all of those confusing and, and you know, just combobulated thoughts and feelings and getting them into a language and learning from that experience and, and understanding things in a new way and, and maybe then translating that into a way to communicate with others and maybe not maybe it's just for you and that's good too so as Penna Baker says there are probably a thousand ways to write that may be beneficial to you so these are rough guidelines rather than truth um, indeed in your own writing experiment on your own and see what works best so we've provided instructions and some readings um, our, our contact information is there. If you have any thoughts or questions, please feel free to reach out. We genuinely invite yes. you to email us after um, the symposium if you have questions or you want to follow up. Yeah, and yes, and look at the resources and see if any of those are helpful to you because they may be. Penna Baker's website is full of interesting things as well. Um, Sometimes you get yeah. prompts. You know, you'll find writing prompts if you just Google writing prompts. Oh yeah, um, you'll find so much to set you in motion. And but if you want specific prompts for expressive writing, yeah, yeah you could look to Penna Baker if you've got one. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want to say is that you know this is. Free. This writing is free. You can do it anytime you want. Have, you've got pen and paper. You can do it. You've got the keyboard, which we all do. Yeah. And there's so in this world that we live in, we're just so typically barraged with things coming in. You know, images and information. It's things are pouring at us through the phone, through all the screens we live amid. And this is really an opportunity for you to. Um, Take what's in out <laughs> rather than be streamed into. You yeah. can stream back yeah. out. And um, we really encourage you to give yourself that. Yeah. If you're comfortable. And if writing feels like something that has to be done, oh, it's not. this is not the moment. Oh, I don't have the time right now. Oh, I'm too tired right now. If you say, I'm just going to do this for 15 minutes. I'm going to find this prompt and I'm going to do it for 15 minutes and just sit down and do it. I think you're much more likely to do it than to wait for that perfect time. I think this makes it a bit easy. So give that a try too.